Hey, you guys know what I love? It's kind of an unsung hero. Electricity. I love electricity, it's everywhere. But think about it, it's like the unsung hero of the world. We take it for granted until it's gone and then we have to live for a couple hours like we're in the 1800s and it's the worst. And, but since we've been able to harness the power of electricity as, as humans, um, there has been just an absolute exponential explosion in the growth of technology. Almost everything that we interact with on a daily basis relies on electricity. I can't think of an industry that doesn't rely on the harnessing of electricity. But just 150 years ago, that wasn't the case. Like, every person who ever lived from the dawn of time until about 130 years ago, they lived and died without ever flipping on a light switch. But we've harnessed that potential that God has infused into the created world, and now we're, like, it's, it feels like there's nothing we can't do by, by harnessing that potential. In such a short time, there's seemingly nothing that we as humans can't do. Heating and cooling systems, uh, which we could use, uh, but they, they, live us, they allow us to live in, in like the harshest climates in, on earth and, and relatively comfortably. And cars, boats, trains, and planes allow us to travel pretty much anywhere we want, whenever. We're getting into, like private companies are getting into space travel and deep sea travel, though I wouldn't suggest signing up for any of those just yet, but there's like nothing that we can't do as people, but there is still one thing that we deal with on a daily basis, every single day without fail, that we have no control over. It's the weather. The weather, every single day, God gives us the gift of new weather every day, and we're pretty much completely dependent on him still for the weather. We've gotten pretty good at, at predicting it, and I'm not talking about our carbon footprint and, and you know, climate change and all of that stuff, but, but day to day, God gives us new weather and, and, and what is the number one thing that we complain about? It's the weather. The one thing that we don't have control over, the one thing that shows us that we're actually finite and that we're not God, that we can't manipulate yet, is the weather. And that's the one thing that we complain about the most. It's too hot, it's too cold, it's too rainy, it's too cloudy, it's too sunny. We all have Goldilocks living inside of our heart. This weather isn't good. This weather is too hot. There's this Goldilocks inside of us, but God gives us the gift of a new weather, new weather every single day, and more times than not, we complain about it. So what are you gonna do if God gives you a rainy day? Well, you can whine and complain about it and become somebody that nobody wants to be around, or it's a rainy day, let's break out a jigsaw puzzle. And you can become somebody that nobody wants to be around, but for some other reason. Because how we respond to your circumstances, how you respond to your circumstances, reveals really who you are. Uh, unwanted circumstances bring to the surface what's deep down inside of us that we can kind of mask when things, are going oh, 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 when things are going okay. You can complain about it and you can become somebody that nobody wants to be around or you can do something with it. Like if there's a, if there's a circumstance that you don't have any control over, like the weather, you might as well embrace it. You don't have control over it. Embrace it and shift Make the best use of it. I don't know what branch of the military it is, but you assess the situation, you adapt, and you overcome. Assess, adapt, and overcome. That's the only option you have other than complaining, but how we respond to our unwanted circumstances actually reveals both our internal attitude towards God. It shows what, what is inside, what we actually believe, not what we say we believe. Do we trust in his sovereignty? Do we trust in his providence? Do we trust that he's good? And it also reveals our priorities. Like, are we gonna let this circumstance deter us from our ultimate goal? So you're on vacation with the kids and it's a rainy day. Your goal of vacation is to relax and have fun? Great, that doesn't mean you have to go to the beach even though that's like the number one priority that you have. Put on their bathing suits and send them outside to play in the rain. You're, you're making memories, you're having fun, you adapt to the situation, you make the best use of it. You pivot adapt to it, grow through it, and continue towards the goal. Not my will, but yours be done, Lord. 
So today we'll be in Acts 25 and 26. And as we continue in the book of Acts today, Paul is in prison. If you remember from last week, he's been in prison for two years, partly for his own safety. Paul's an incredible, for those of you who just heard that we're going through two chapters today and panicked that you're gonna like die of heat stroke, I'm gonna go quick. Um, but partly for his own safety, he's in jail and, and partly um, because uh, he is making disturbances. Now, it's not his fault that these disturbances are happening. People are responding negatively to him. Paul's an incredibly polarizing figure. The church loves him, even though he can kind of rub against people in the church even. But the leaders of the Jews in Jerusalem, they're trying to kill him because they think that he's blaspheming and, and bringing other people to blaspheme with him. And they're, they're politicking and, and planning to kill have him killed, and the Romans don't know what to do with him because he hasn't done anything worthy of death as far as Rome's concerned, but they think that his, his message is nuts. Like, Paul, you're telling me your message is a dead and resurrected man God from Judea. Okay, that's crazy. But Paul won't back down. He won't quit. He won't give in. He's not gonna give in to bribery. He's confounding everybody. He's been in jail two years in the city of Caesarea Maritima, about 70 miles northwest of Jerusalem on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And Paul already kind of knows what's going to happen. He's been shown the end of the chapter. If you remember back in, in Acts 23, 11, Jesus appeared to Paul um, a few years ago, but a few chapters ago, and, and he appeared to him and he, he told him, Paul, take courage, for as you've testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. So the Lord has already told Paul, you're going to Rome, you're going to testify about me in Rome. The end, that's already there. Paul just doesn't know, he's not privy to the route or, or the timetable. He knows that Jesus has called him to Rome, but he doesn't know how he's gonna get there. So he continues to trust, and he doesn't wait for the destination. He's not like, all right, well, I'll keep my mouth shut until I get there. No, he's like, all right, great, you're gonna take me on the scenic route? More people. I get to tell more and more people. So he's not waiting for the destination to, to start doing what he's been called to do, to testify. Uh, it's all he's doing is testifying to anybody who will listen. And he gets to take the scenic route to Rome. So, to, to Rome. so last week, Paul got arrested and he testified to Felix, who was a governor in Judea. And this week, he has an opportunity to testify to this guy named Festus, who is the new governor. He took over from, for Felix and to Herod Agrippa. It's like, it's like a video game, and he keeps leveling up against heavier and heavier bosses, harder and harder bosses, all the way up to Caesar. But so Herod Agrippa, he was the, the Jewish king. He was the last Jewish king. This is the guy, he's from the Herodian dynasty. There are so many Herods in the Bible, it can be easy to confuse them. But Herod the Great, this is his great-great-grandfather. Herod the Great, he's the guy who had all the babies killed back when Jesus was born in the Christmas story. And then there was Herod Antipas, who had uh, Jesus and John the Baptist killed. And then there was Herod Agrippa I, who had James killed earlier in the book of Acts. And now we have Paul standing in, st in front of Herod Agrippa II. And this, this family has a terrible track record with the people of God, and Paul knows that very well. But Festus takes over from Felix, and one of the first things that he wants to do is he wants to go down to Jerusalem and find out how he can help them out. He wants to get the, the leaders in Jerusalem kind of on his side. How can I, how can I kind of, you know, grease the wheels, make sure that things are good? So, the, he, t he talks to the rulers in Jerusalem and there it's almost like a mafia s scene where he gets in there and he's like, hey, I wanted to talk to you guys. Wh what can I do for you? And they're like, yeah, we heard that there's this guy, Pauly, up there in Caesarea. We'd like to have a conversation with them. And, and Paul's like, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, Felix is, is like, all right, great. Well, I'm actually going back to, to Caesarea in a couple days. Why don't you guys come with me? We'll have the trial right there. Now, they want to they don't want to have a conversation with Paul. They're already plotting to have him killed, looking for every possibility that they can. But they go back to Caesarea all together and they have his trial. But just like Jesus, they can't get anything to stick. Just like Jesus, they make all their accusations against him and they have no evidence because Paul is innocent. And Festus, he wants to do the Jewish leaders a favor. He's trying to, he's trying to kind of balance both sides here. And so we're gonna start in verse nine. This is Festus talking to Paul. He says, do you wanna go up in Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? 
But Paul said, I'm standing before Caesar's tribunal where I, ought, where I ought to be tried. To the Jews, I've done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then I'm a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there's nothing to their charges against me, no one can give them up. Give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he conferred with his counsel, answered, to Caesar you've appealed? To Caesar you shall go. So Paul's in this unwinnable situation here. He's in an unwinnable situation. He's innocent on the charges that are against him. People want to kill him. His, his choices seem to be he can go back to Jerusalem and get murdered or he can stay here in Caesarea in jail. Those are your choices, Paul. But what he does is, he, 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 if, if you're familiar with Star Trek, he does the Kobayashi Maru. He takes a, a, an unwinnable situation and he somehow finds a way to win it, which, which is by appealing to, to Caesar. Now, this was a right that every Roman citizen had, and Paul was a Roman citizen. It's called the Lex de Republica. I'm sure Tom Patrick can correct my Latin after this. Um, but uh, instead of being tried by a lesser official, every Roman citizen had the right to be tried in Rome. So instead of being imprisoned or killed by a lesser official, a Roman citizen could go to Rome and have his case tried. So Paul is going to Rome. He's going to Rome, just like Jesus told him he was going to go to Rome. That's where he's headed. He's in chains. That wasn't part of the plan, but apparently it was. And he looked at his circumstances, stay in Caesarea, head to Jerusalem, neither of those are Rome, and he made the best of them, made the best play that he possibly could. He accepted his circumstances that he did not want, and he made the best possible use of it. He looked at his mission, he looked at who he knows God is, and he appealed to Caesar, and he's going to Caesar. He wasn't deterred, he made the best possible use of his situation. Not my will, God, but yours be done. Paul's trust in God's sovereignty over his circumstance enabled him to embrace his circumstances and leverage them to fulfill his mission. His circumstances were not gonna stop him. So Paul's on his way to Rome, but before that, he gets sent to, uh, before he gets sent to Rome, Festus is having a conversation with Agrippa, and he explains what's going on, and Agrippa's like, I gotta meet this guy. And so they set up a meeting. And uh, what do you think Paul's gonna talk about when Agrippa gets there? I bet it's Jesus. So Agrippa and his wife Bernice come. We'll pick up in Acts 26.1. It says, so Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself? Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it's before you, King Agrippa, that I'm going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you're familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem is known by all the Jews. They've known for a long time, if they're willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made to, by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope, I'm accused by Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. Not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them, even to foreign cities. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But rise, 
Stand upon your feet, for, we've appeared, for I've appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So Festus and Agrippa are two of the most powerful people in the region, Agrippa arguably the most powerful, and Paul is talking boldly, holding nothing back, showing them that while they view themselves as the authority, they have man-made authority, ultimately they are bound by Satan. They have the power. They're not the ones in chains. They're not going to sleep in a prison cell tonight like Paul is. But they're prisoners in their unbelief. And Paul, he's wearing chains. He has to, 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 to stay in that prison. He's not walking around the city freely. He's not able to go and visit the churches and encourage the, the, the Christians the way that he wants to. But in Christ, he is free. Continue in verse 19. He says, therefore... O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to the small and the great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he'd proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. So Paul wraps up this message by making the most of his current circumstance. He's defending himself, but he's not really defending himself. He's defending the truth of what he has seen. He's trying to to give people an opportunity to taste what he has tasted, to have what he has. He's already said he's not afraid to die. He's not scared of, uh, like, whatever the Lord has for me, that's what I have. But his conscience is clear. But he knows what he's seen. And he's not backing down from it. He knows what the scriptures say. The Messiah, the one who was promised all the way back in the garden, he was going to come. He had to come. He had to suffer. He had to die and be raised again in order to proclaim light and reconciliation and freedom and truth and forgiveness to all people. And that's why Paul's a prisoner. Because this message disturbs the status quo. This message disrupts the power structures of the world. It unites all people under Christ. It means that everybody has to lay down their own authority and sit under the the authority of Jesus Christ, which brings us together. It means that your authority, wherever you are, you have a purpose in that given to you by God. And powerful people hate this message because it levels the playing ground. It, It tells us that we all fall short. But it also tells us that if we're willing to confess that and accept God's grace and forgiveness, then we can be made one in Christ. Verse 24, and as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Paul, your great learning is driving you out of your mind. Paul, you are nuts. You have too many, you have studied way too much, Paul. This is, you sound like a crazy person. You ever received pushback? when you're sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. I'll just say this, I'm so incredibly glad glad that my father-in-law was willing to tell me the truth, before he was my father-in-law, was willing to tell me the truth and to endure my pushback, to patiently walk alongside of me and answer my questions and continue to pray for me until the Spirit opened my eyes. But Paul doesn't even allow the circumstance of Festus calling him crazy to deter him. He speaks even more boldly, continue reading in 25. But Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. I'm speaking true and rational words. For the king, that's Agrippa, he knows about these things. And to him I speak boldly. For I'm persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. This this isn't like some secret thing that we went off in the woods and found some golden tablets and nobody else is allowed to see them but us. This is, uh, he rose from the dead. Where's his body? He appeared to us. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, 
but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king rose and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, this man's doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free had he not appealed to Caesar. Paul's innocent. He's only guilty of, of telling the truth and, and making people mad so that they are attacking him. Giving people an opportunity to, to hear the truth of, of what he knows, that Jesus is the Messiah, that anybody, that anybody can be forgiven of their sins, reconciled to God through Jesus' death and resurrection. That's Jew, that's Gentile, that's peasant, that's king, that's whoever, that's whoever, that's you, wherever you are, God is giving you an opportunity to be reconciled back into his family. And powerful people don't like this message because it means that they have to lay down some of their power. It means that somebody is in charge of them. Paul made the most of his unwanted circumstances. And like I said earlier, how you respond to your circumstances reveals at least two things. It reveals our internal attitude towards God. It reveals deep down what we actually believe about who he is. Do we trust his sovereignty and providence? Do we trust that he's actually in charge? Do we trust his character? Do we trust that he's actually good? Do we trust his promises? And it also reveals our priorities. Like, are we going to allow this circumstance to get us off track? Are we going to allow it to get us, uh, deter us from our goal of becoming more like Jesus and helping other people know about him and become more like them themselves? We can pivot, adapt to the circumstance, grow through it, and continue towards that goal, whatever our priority actually is. Not my will, but your will be done, God. The Apostle Paul in this section passed a massive test. He's in that unwinnable situation. The circumstance he finds himself in is unfair, it's unjust, it's not good. Agrippa himself said that Paul was innocent and had he not appealed to Caesar, we could set him free right now. This is no take backs. But because Paul trusts God's sovereign hand, he trusts God's providence, he believes the promises that Jesus made, not just the happy ones, but the ones that we go, mm, in this world you'll have tribulation. You will have tribulation if you follow Jesus. You're gonna have tribulation if you don't follow Jesus too, but guess what? If you follow Jesus, he's with you in it, so that's a lot better of a deal. <laughs> in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world, Jesus said. He says, blessed are you when others revile you. That's when you're blessed. When others persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Paul knows Mark 13, 9 where Jesus said to be on your guard for they'll deliver you over to councils and you'll be beaten in synagogues and you'll stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. That's what Paul believes following Jesus is because that's what Jesus said part of following him is. And Paul is living into that mission that Jesus has given him. Do we expect those things? Do we actually expect those things? It's a lot easier to endure it if you expect it. Paul can endure these things because he's ready for it. He's prepared for it. He's already died. He said in Galatians, I was crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. He took Jesus at his words. He didn't prioritize his comfort. He didn't prioritize ease. His priority was obeying Christ, fulfilling the mission that Jesus had given him. And we gotta take note on that. And look at Paul. Look at, like in his flesh, you know what I'd be saying if I was Paul in this? I'd be like, I've been, on, I've been locked up in jail for two years. Two years. I did nothing wrong. And I've been locked up for two, you know how many churches I could have planted in two years? I could be in Spain right now planting churches. But no, you guys make a mockery of justice. You sit, stick me in this cell and, and, and yelling at God, God, how could you let your servant go through something like this? God, what are you doing? I've done nothing but, but 
do what you asked me to do and here's where you put me? That's not what Paul says. That's not how he responds. He's unshakable. Gosh, I want to be like that guy, except for the chains. But that's how you get like that guy. He knows, come what may, God is with him. And he's willing to enter every sovereignly chosen circumstance with that in mind. God is present with him and has a purpose for him in that. And because of that mindset, he is able to overcome the world the same way that Jesus was. Not my will, but yours be done. And that's where I want to encourage you this morning. How do you respond when you have an unwanted circumstance? With faith or with frustration? with some sort of mixture of the two. Paul has every right to like regret his decision. He was just heard, well like what if he overheard, had he not appealed to Caesar, he could be set free right now. It's like I could have, like I take it back, I take it back, but like as soon as you appeal to Caesar, that's a no take back game. And he could stay in his cell and he'd be like, gosh, uh, the whole way to Rome, like if I could just go back to that one moment, just take that one thing back the more he would allow himself to live in that regret, to allow himself to to live in that what-if scenario, the more useless he would become because he's no longer looking out on the horizon of what God has for him, but he's looking backwards at the thing that has already happened and can't change. Complaining is one of the least useful things we can do as people. It feels really good. Amen? (laughs) No? Just me? (laughs) It feels really good, but it's like digging your own grave. You're just kind of, it feels like you're doing something, but you're just digging your own grave. I don't know who said it. It pops into my mind all the time. Those who complain the most accomplish the least. It, It seems normal. It feels regular. It feels almost human, but it reveals a lack of faith in who we know God to be, in his sovereignty, in his providence. Instead of complaining, we can lament we have that gift as, as Christians. We can lament, we can pray. Instead of re- regretting and living in the past, you say, God, that wasn't fair. God, what are you doing? Where are you? Where were you in that circumstance, God? And then we have the freedom also to, to sit and wait. God, where were you in that circumstance? How were you disciplining me t- towards Christ-likeness? How were you growing my trust? How were you teaching me to believe you and to see you? How were you building in me a courage and a fortitude and a tenderness so that I could minister to others? God, how could I have handled that in a a more Christ-honoring way? That's the only way that we can live by looking backwards. That's the only healthy way is to grow from it, to, to ask the Lord, how did you grow me in that? Otherwise, you're gonna have to do the same test over and over and over. Paul is absolutely confounding these guys and it wins him an audience. He doesn't miss out on the opportunity to share Jesus with anybody. His response reveals his heart. It shows what's inside because he knows he's read the trials of Abraham and Joseph and David and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Nehemiah and Esther and Job and Jesus. He knows that God worked all of those difficult trials for the good of his people, for the good of the world. So he's able to lean into what he already knows about God and his character and the story that he's living in and prioritize his mission regardless of circumstances. And now he's off to Rome to tell Caesar about Jesus. Paul's trust in God's sovereignty over his circumstances enabled him to embrace those circumstances and leverage them to fulfill his mission. So if you find yourself complaining about your circumstances or you're caught up in something that happened to you in the past, the first question that I want you to remember is this. Who is God and what is he like? Who is he and what is he like? Because the God revealed in scripture is powerful. He is sovereign over everything. And he is radically good. Radically good. He will challenge you. He will make you uncomfortable. He will allow you to go through things that you'd rather not go through. He will will do all of those things for your good, but he will never tempt you to sin and he will be with you in the middle of all of them. In every circumstance, I will be content in every circumstance. That's my provider. And he promises to be your strength in the middle of it, provide you with strength. So why do we struggle in our own power, which continually comes up short? 
We need each other for this, guys. We need each other for this, to remind each other, because man, I'm forgetful. But he wants to use you for more than you're comfortable with being used for. He wants to use you with more than you're comfortable with being used for. Who is he and what is he like? The second question you gotta ask is this. <laughs> this is a tough one, you're not gonna like this. How much responsibility do I have for putting myself here? Like when you don't like the circumstance you're in, you gotta own it. Like God is sovereign over all the things, but that doesn't mean that you're not culpable. Like how much, how much do I have, how much responsibility do I have for putting myself in this situation? Listen. We have the freedom as Christians to repent. Like that's one of the greatest gifts is that we confess we are sinners. We mess up all the time. So that gives us the freedom to man up, to own up to our, to our foolish decisions. I'll tell you how I got here. Uh, you know, I love, um, I love you, you guys wanna have a, a good, this is free, good date night, free at home date night, one star reviews. Just sit, get, get some snacks, go f- like, you and your, your, your spouse, your, whoever, um, you, you grab your phones, find some one-star reviews and just read them back and forth to each other. I was rolling laughing the other night while I was reading the one-star review of an Indian restaurant. I can't repeat that one. But I'll, I'll read an, a, a one-star review here for you by a woman named Abby. This is for lemon bars. She said, way, way, way too lemony and not good at all. I don't understand why so many people are leaving five-star reviews. I have the worst heartburn from all the lemon and the recipe made my kitchen a huge mess. I got so frustrated that I yelled at my boyfriend for no reason. One star. And God bless Abby. Aren't we all a little bit Abby? These lemon bars are too lemony. And then the recipe made my kitchen a huge mess. I had nothing to do with it. It was the recipe that did it. And then... I yelled at my boyfriend for no reason. This, this recipe's a disaster. Maybe lemon bars weren't the best decision that Abby made that day. Maybe Abby wasn't the best decision her boyfriend made. But get honest enough. <laughs> get honest enough to own it, right? Don't leave God a one-star review because you didn't follow the recipe. I feel spiritually dry. Well, have you been reading your Bible? You're in connection group? How's your prayer life? Well, you know, things are tough. It's busy. When was the last time you stepped into an uncomfortable situation where you actually needed God to come through for you? Wow, I don't like the sound of that. Well, okay, Abby. <laughs> I get it, you know? I feel that too. I have Abby in me. But finally, okay. The, 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 the last question that you gotta answer is this, and we're wrapping up here, I promise. It's what's my purpose? What's my mission? Why am I here? Paul's mission, his purpose was to preach the gospel, to plant churches, and to strengthen Christians. Jesus himself told him, that's exactly why I've, I've raised you up, Paul. That's your purpose. What's yours? It, it's not the same as Paul's. It's under the same umbrella, but you're probably not called to go and plant a bunch of churches all around the world. But what is it? Because we were created for an adventure. Kids, this is where I want you to hear me. Mom, you might want to cover your ears at this point. But kids, you were made for adventure. For adventure. Not to be comfortable. Not to have an easy life. You were made for an adventure. That's what God wants for you. That's why you play video games. That's why video games are a $400 billion a year industry. Because we want to be a part of something that's, that's scary. We want to be a part of something that's risky. We want to be a part of something that's bigger than us. And a fantasy adventure is better than no adventure. But that's not what God is calling us towards. He's calling us to live an actual adventure, to take risks which are no risks at all when he's in the middle of it. It might not pan out the way that you want it to, but if he's in it, it will not return void. When we, we aim at the wrong thing, that, that's, the, that's the worst fear that I have. But when we aim at the wrong thing, you can find meaning, you can find purpose still, 
You feel motivated, you, you feel invigorated to get up in the morning, to, to go take that next step towards that thing. You know, you feel that drive. But for those who finally actually achieve it, for those who actually get that thing, who after grinding for so long, finally get their hope, finally get their hands on it, that whatever it is, that fame or wealth or that, that woman or, or power or that championship or promotion or corner office, or you name it, whatever it is, when they finally get their hands on it, they realize that it's empty. It's meaningless. It's, it's, a, it's a hollow Easter bunny. You, you know that feeling? You saw the Easter bunny and you're like, look at all that chocolate. And then you go and you bite into the ears and it's like, oh, this is terrible. It's not even that good and it's empty inside. It doesn't fill the hole in their heart that they thought it would once you finally get that thing. That's partly why, at least, we're living in this age of anxiety where we also have all the technological marvels that our grandparents and, and ancestors could have never dreamed of. If you had told somebody like four generations ago the stuff that we would have, they'd be like, you must be smiling all the time. You must never not smile. And it's like, actually, we're having a really tough time over here because we've not only lost the struggle, we've kind of lost the meaning behind the struggle. We're floating around like astronauts in the ether, not tethered to anything. We've lost the adventure. God has adventure for us. Jim Carrey's the one who famously said that I think that everybody should get rich and famous in everything they ever dreamed of, which we love that part. And then he goes on to say, so that they can see that it's not the answer. It's not the answer. But that's what we keep aiming at. I, I think everybody should get rich and famous and get everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. You say, well, I'd rather be rich and depressed than just regular depressed, and that's fair enough, I get that, me too. But what about living into your purpose? What about finding that thing that God has made you for? Where your Venn diagram, that overlap of how God has created you and where he has put you overlap and the, the mission that he has for you, and, and living into that, prioritizing around that thing, Secularism, postmodernism, they promised us that, that through technological advancement and living your truth, we'd, we'd end up with this godless utopia. And that's not working. We're adrift without meaning. We're trying to create our own meaning, and it stinks. It's not big enough. The secret to happiness isn't stuff and circumstances. It comes from finding your purpose and pursuing it with your whole heart. That's the meaning of life. The purpose of every single one of you, I can tell you what it is, I can't get specific, <laughs> but every single one of you, you are made to know God, to love God, to realize and get it through our thick skulls that God actually loves us and then go help other people learn that too. But specifically, how has he, how has he made you to do that? Think about the, the, the careers that are the most rewarding. Like the most rewarding things in the world are some of the hardest things to do. Not most appreciated, but most rewarding. It's like teaching. Why is teaching so rewarding? Because it's wicked hard. Coaching, nursing, EMTs, physicians. Why are these things rewarding? Because they're wicked hard. Why is being a parent so rewarding? Because it's wicked hard. You were created for a mission. And when you take your eyes off of the ultimate, to love God, to make disciples, you'll be susceptible to all of your circumstances. But you remember that the creator God made you on purpose, put you somewhere on purpose, gifted you with skills on purpose, and he redeemed you through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ so that you could help other people know that true. And he equipped you with the Holy Spirit so that you don't have to do it in your own strength, in your own power. You'll be an unshakable force of love that confounds the world, that won't kneel to the forces of the world, but stands up to them and says, actually, it's, it's Jesus. But that has to start with experiencing God's grace in your life, continually, over and over. And that starts with sharing it with one another. We are forgetful, we need reminders. I need you, I'm a pastor, I do this for a living. And I need people to tell me, hey, Kevin, God's in control. And guess what? He loves you. He's forgiven your sins. He's in it with you. I don't know what the end of your story looks like. I just know that he is writing it and he's really good. You can surrender to that and know that whatever he does, 
He's in it with you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you have not forsaken us. God, we dream too small a lot of the times. Lord, we um, settle for comfort and ease when you're calling us uh, to discomfort and joy. God, would you help us to understand who you are? To not be persuaded by the, the easy way out or, or, or whatever would cause us to, to walk one way when you're calling us the other. Father, thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul and thank you that his boldness has actually led to us being here now because he told people and they told people and they told people and somebody told me and now, God, we want other people to know Lord, that you are in control and that you are good. Father, not our will, but yours be done. Please, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.